Energy comes in all sorts of different forms. There's chemical, thermal, gravitational, but it was electromagnetic energy that brought us into the modern era. EM energy is so great because it can be generated a long distance away from where it's needed. Now typically we just use wires for moving this energy, but sometimes they aren't practical or convenient. But with wireless energy, you don't need long fragile cables to provide power, and it also has the advantage of being really frickin' cool. Today I'm going to demonstrate a bunch of different methods of wireless energy transmission. But before I go on, I should warn you that the experiments done in this video were done completely for educational purposes. And in fact, if you were to try any of this stuff at home, you'd probably die or at least get exposed to a ton of electromagnetic radiation. So yeah, please don't try this at home. There's a good chance that you've seen one of these wireless cell phone chargers that have gotten really popular recently. Now for something that seems so futuristic, it's actually based on really old technology. One of the first discoveries of wireless energy transmission was by Michael Faraday in 1831. He noticed that when he wrapped two coils of wire around an iron ring and hooked up one of the coils to a battery, a voltage would be produced in the other the moment it was connected and disconnected. Now this led to the formulation of Faraday's law of induction and is the basis for how a transformer works. In fact, a wireless phone charger is simply just half of a transformer, where the other half is located in your phone. Now this is actually really easy to test with just a coil of wire and an LED. The coils in a transformer transfer energy via electromagnetic fields, so they don't actually have to be connected via wires. Here's a big transformer that I modified so that it converts high voltage low current into low voltage high current. Now the voltage is actually way too low to shock me, but the current it dumps is so extreme that it can heat up this coin until it's red hot. Another common form of wireless energy transfer is via a capacitor, as it'll pass AC current without actually having a wire connecting the plates. An example of this is when I light up the CFL here with this plasma globe. Now what's happening here is that the uh, plasma globe is generating a high frequency AC that's being uh, transmitted through the imaginary capacitor that's being formed between it and the light bulb. The methods I've shown so far only work over very short distances. So how do we power up something that's more than just a few centimeters away? One way is to generate such an extreme electric field that plasma channels form in mid-air. The plasma formed from a device like this Tesla coil is actually a really good conductor, and it can act as a temporary wire to power up nearby objects. But even without an arc, this coil can still provide wireless power. In fact, none of the lights in this room are even plugged in. This is actually the same effect as I showed earlier with the plasma globe and the light bulb and that there's an imaginary capacitor between the coil and the object that I'm powering. Here's a case that's best described with two imaginary capacitors, because I've made myself a part of this circuit. Now there's one capacitor going from these old neon bulbs to the Tesla coil, and then another between me and ground. Apparently I'm really conductive at this voltage and frequency, as I link these imaginary capacitors enough to light up these bulbs very brightly. Now compared to the plasma globe, yeah the Tesla coil has a lot more power, but more importantly, the coil is oscillating at a much higher frequency. Here I have a plasma globe and a much smaller Tesla coil. Now the plasma globe can only light the bulb when it's really close to it. But when I use this Tesla coil, the bulb lights at a much further distance. Now that's because the coil's frequency is way higher than the globe's. So that means it can send power through a much smaller imaginary capacitor. Now this is easy to see mathematically with the formula for capacitive impedance, where the impedance lowers with a higher frequency. As the distance from the coil grows, the capacitor becomes too tiny to transmit much power. Now I can cheat a bit though, with an energy harvesting device like the simple rectenna. Now even though I'm too far away to light up any light bulbs, I can still collect enough energy here to charge up these capacitors. Although Tesla coils are dramatic, they just aren't a good method of sending energy far away. If you take a look at the math involved, you'll see that you need to generate electromagnetic waves to make a significant impact on distant items. Now Tesla coils do generate some radio waves, but not very efficiently because that's not what they're designed to do. But even if you have a really good radio transmitter, it's still not going to be an efficient method of powering distant objects. Now the reason being is that diffraction effects and the uh, inverse square law are going to cause this power to spread out really quickly over a distance. In fact, if you want to power up distant objects, you're going to have to come up with some sort of collimated energy beam. And no, you can't beat the inverse square law, but you can definitely limit diffraction effects by cranking up the frequency. And that brings us to our next form of wireless energy transfer, and that's with microwaves. 
We observe wireless energy transfer every time we cook food in the microwave. In this case, energy is transferred via microwave radiation and converted into heat when absorbed by food. This really isn't that exciting though, because if you're watching from the outside, it doesn't look any different than just cooking a regular old oven. But in fact, this oven right here is actually producing a very strong electromagnetic field. You've probably noticed that when you microwave things that are already on fire, the oven fills up with an angry glowing plasma. So why does this happen? The flame produces a small amount of charged particles that get rapidly accelerated by the field until they smash into neutral molecules in the air. This generates even more charged ions, and the process continues in a chain reaction that ends up filling the oven with plasma. The electromagnetic properties of the oven are also easily observed with things like low pressure gas tubes and pointed conductors. But how effective are microwaves at powering up things far away? To test this, I have this microwave oven that still operates with the door open, and I'll be doing this experiment in a giant Faraday cage. If I hold the CFL close to the oven, it lights up pretty brightly, but the effect starts dropping off pretty rapidly as I pull it away. Now I know what you're thinking. What about radiation? Well yeah, without the proper precautions, you can get some pretty nasty burns doing an experiment like this. But cancer? I mean, honestly, this is non-ionizing radiation. So really, your risk is a lot higher by just stepping into a tanning booth than getting the occasional blast of microwaves. So how do we make a beam out of it? Well, you've probably seen videos of DIY microwave horn guns here on YouTube. But truth be told, these are nothing more than just microwave flashlights. Because it turns out it's next to impossible to make any sort of collimated energy beam from microwave oven parts. In fact, if you calculate the diffraction limit at this frequency, you're going to find that you need something like a 1 meter wide reflector just to bring the divergence down to 10 degrees. And honestly, that's still pretty terrible for a beam. Now, if portability isn't a requirement, then microwaves can still be very effective at remote powering. In fact, as early as the 1960s, there were successful attempts at powering aircraft completely with microwaves. And nowadays, with a large uh, ground-based microwave transmitter, you could keep swarms of drones in the air indefinitely. And honestly, that's pretty terrifying. There are already proposals to collect huge amounts of solar power in space, and then beam that power back to Earth using microwaves. Well, what if we don't want to use colossal transmitters? Or we just want to power up stuff that's really far away? Well, like most problems in life, this can be solved with very powerful lasers. At visible light frequencies, the wavelength of light is small enough that even a tiny device can be used to produce a well-collimated beam. This is why a laser with a power of under a watt can still produce enough energy density to light things on fire from across the room. In fact, using some beam expansion optics, I can use a 1 watt laser to pop a balloon from 50 meters away. Now if you wanted to generate the same power density at that distance with a portable microwave device, it would probably have to be over a million times more powerful. Now the same properties that make a laser beam great at sending power far away also allow the energy to be focused to a very tiny spot. This means that when I stick this chunk of cardboard in the focal point of this laser beam, the power density in that tiny volume that's absorbing all the light is probably even higher than what's inside of a nuclear reactor. This is especially useful for things like tattoo removal and laser cutting, where you need to produce an extremely high power density with high accuracy. Now lasers aren't just useful for heating things up, and in fact you can use them to generate electricity. As an example, here I have some LEDs. Now when I apply power to them, they do their usual LED thing and emit pretty photons. But watch what happens when I shine a laser onto them. I can actually read a voltage across the LED when the beam hits it. Here I've connected some smaller LEDs to the initial ones. Now when the laser hits the first LED, it actually generates enough power to light up the second one. Now it's kind of hard to see with the laser overpowering all the rest of the light. So here I've put some goggles over the camera so you can see the effect better. Pretty cool, right? The more obvious way to convert laser light back to electricity is with photovoltaics. But as I just showed, LEDs can actually act as photovoltaics, just not very well. But in fact, the reverse is also true, and I can use a solar cell as a garbage LED. Now I can't see any visible light when I apply power to the solar cell, but if I look with my IR camera, I can actually see the infrared emission. And no, it's not very bright, but that's because it's much better at collecting light than it is at making it. Now let's try actually using components the way they were intended to. Now with the solar cell here, just the tiny amount of ambient light in the room is enough to generate a voltage across it. Now when I shine a laser at it, the voltage does increase, but surprisingly not by much. Let's try adding a small load to it, in this case a 10k ohm resistor. Now when the ambient light hits it, it doesn't raise the voltage by much, and now the laser's effect is much more obvious when the beam hits it. I can also swap out the resistor with an LED, and then use a laser to remotely power it. Now if I try this with two LEDs, the voltage across the cell can't get high enough to light them up both. 
But if I add a device like this makeshift jewel thief, I can boost what little voltage is generated so that it can overcome the forward voltage of the LEDs. Now the same concept is useful for things like charging batteries and meeting the voltage requirements of other devices. Now I can power more than just lice with this method. Here I have some tiny solar powered cars that are meant to roll around on a sunny day. Now when the concentrated laser beam hits them, they fly off really quickly. Although I probably would too if a giant laser beam came out of the sky. Unfortunately there is a lot of wasted power in a setup like this. As an example, here I have a big green laser that I'll be using to power a solar cell. Now it outputs about a watt of light, but it uses nearly 10 times that in electrical power. Now when used to power an LED through a solar cell, I only recover a couple milliwatts of this power. Now if I use a lens to spread out the beam over the entire cell, I can do 10 times better, but still this only gives 0.2% conversion efficiency. This setup is far from optimized though. In fact, there are already lasers with wall plug efficiencies of greater than 50%. Now if you couple that with a photovoltaic material that has a band gap tuned to the laser's wavelength, then it's possible to have a conversion efficiency of over 25%. Now that may not seem great, but for long distance wireless energy transmission, it's the best we have yet. When I'm just powering stuff across my shop, this may not seem so impressive. But the thing is, I could use these very lasers to power stuff from kilometers away. Now if you used a big enough reflector, you could even power spacecraft from astronomical distances. In fact, a laser propelled spacecraft is likely to be our best shot at exploring nearby stars in the foreseeable future. Now before I end this video, I want to clarify a few things. So I want you guys to know is that in all my demonstrations of wireless energy, or really any form of energy transfer, there's always some source of energy. Now this could be a laser beam, it could be an electrical generator, it could be the sun. But never at any point is energy just created out of thin air. Now I know here on YouTube there's a lot of videos on things like perpetual motion, or a free energy that's often associated with Tesla. Well these videos are just flat out wrong, because energy cannot be created or destroyed. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics, and, and those laws are probably the most sacred physical laws of the universe. So in fact, if anybody tells you that they're getting more energy out of something than they're putting in, well either their data is bad or they're just flat out lying, because there's no other way around it. One more thing. So earlier I said that the inverse square law makes radio waves inefficient at wireless energy transmission. Well some people may point out that if you treat the earth ionosphere system as a resonant cavity, and then drive it on one of these resonance peaks, well then the uh, inverse square law no longer applies because now you have this planetary scale a standing electromagnetic wave. Well the issue with this is that it requires absolutely gigantic transmitters and receivers to recover even just the tiniest bit of this power. And honestly if you're going to be building something of this scale, you're really just better off using wires. Well I guess that's about it for this video, but until the next time, stay safe and happy lazing.